Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 virtual Grand Canyon Star Party. I'm Ranger Raider Lane, the National Park Service coordinator for the event. And for 30 years running, Grand Canyon has been celebrating our pristine night skies through the annual Grand Canyon Star Party. Ordinarily, we invite hundreds of astronomers and thousands upon thousands of visitors to enjoy eight nights of some of the most pristine night skies in the United States. Each evening is typically kicked off with a special guest speaker in our theater. That's followed by telescope viewing, constellation programs, night sky photography workshops, and much, much more. Now, next year's Grand Canyon Star Party is June 5th through the 12th, 2021. So mark your calendars and fingers crossed, hopefully we'll be able to celebrate that on site here at Grand Canyon next year. But this year, we kind of wanted to bring you a taste of what Grand Canyon Star Party is like through the virtual realm. We wanted to try to mirror how a night at Grand Canyon uh, Star Party might unfold here on site. So we're really lucky um, that uh, each evening from June 13th to June 20th, 2020 this year, we uh, have our special guest speakers who are all willing to share their talks online with us. We're also excited to bring you some of the wonders of the summer sky into your homes with our virtual telescope viewing sessions that will premiere right after this program. So stay tuned for that. Before we introduce our special guest this evening, I just have to thank a couple of entities that helped the National Park Service in putting on this awesome event. First, I wanna thank the Grand Canyon Conservancy. Now that's the park's official nonprofit partner. They're doing all sorts of amazing things in the park. Some of their current priorities are trail restoration, the Desert View Intertribal Heritage Site, which is an amazing revolutionary project going on at the Watchtower area of the park. Uh, they fund research and education in the park. And importantly, they're also uh, uh, very much uh, um, interested in protecting the night skies here at Grand Canyon through their dark sky preservation programs. So through the generous support of Grand Canyon Conservancy and their supporters, Grand Canyon National Park was able to inventory 5,000 lights in the park and retrofit or change out over 1,500 of those fixtures become night sky friendly. We have plans to retrofit many more fixtures in the park to become night sky friendly. And through this, we were able to become certified as an international dark sky park. And we are undoubtedly one of the largest, most complex international dark sky parks in the world. The very same year, last year, 2019, Grand Canyon National Park was awarded the International Dark Sky Park of the Year by the International Dark Sky Association. Now they're the nonprofit entity that certifies parks and communities as international dark sky places, among a whole host of other things they do. Their mission is to preserve and protect the nighttime environment and our heritage of dark skies through environmentally responsible outdoor lighting. We thank the International Dark Sky Association and their tremendous staff, and we hope they keep up the great work. Finally, Grand Canyon's International Dark Sky Place of the Year could not have been achieved without the dedication, the passion, and the expertise of the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. They're our essential partner for putting on the Grand Canyon Star Party each year. And following this presentation in the virtual telescope viewing sessions, the astronomers are going to be in the chat room, so please thank them if you get a chance. They are doing this out of their love for the night skies on a complete volunteer basis. And the National Park Service is really proud to work with them on this endeavor. And with that, I want to introduce you to tonight's special guest speaker. Tonight we are speaking with Dr. Danielle Adams. She is the Director of Marketing and Communications for Lowell Observatory. She earned her PhD in 2018 from the School of Middle Eastern Studies and North African Studies at the University of Arizona with a minor in cultural anthropology from the School of Anthropology. Her dissertation research centered on the development of Arabian astronomy from pre-Islam into the uh, first centuries of the Abbasid uh, 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 period, making her uh, academic program uh, at U of A highly interdisciplinary, combining fields of uh, MENA area studies, Arabic literature, cultural anthropology, and astronomy. Uh, she is fluent in Arabic. She lived in Beirut, Lebanon for three years while studying Arabic poetry and Arabian astronomical texts. Her research presents for the first time Arabian stars within their own cultural contexts. 
While at the University of Arizona, Dr. Adams earned a NASA Space Grant uh, Graduate Fellowship through which she was able to disseminate uh, her cultural astronomy research to the general public. At Lowell Observatory, she continues to be active in astronomy education, speaking to various groups about Arabian cultural astronomy and the heritage of the many Ara Arabic star names astronomers use today. She is also an associate member of the International Astronomical Union's Working Group of Star Names, where she lends her expertise on Arabian and Islamic astronomical traditions. Tonight, Dr. Adams will present Lions, Vultures, and a Scorpion, Oh my, a summer jaunt through the Arabian skies. Dr. Adams, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Raider. It's a pleasure to be here uh, again for the Grand Canyon Star Party, uh, virtual edition, I suppose. And, um, you know, this time, uh, even though we're not together in person, um, we still have some uh, really neat things to show in the night sky uh, and a great thing about this is that uh, a lot of these are bright naked eye scar uh, stars and so uh, this is something that uh, everyone can participate in at home. Uh, a lot of these will be visible from uh, light polluted areas like cities uh, and of course most of it uh, will certainly be uh, visible from nice rural areas depending on your latitude. So uh, thank you again uh, for this opportunity and uh, we'll get started here. So my name again is Danielle Adams and I am the Deputy Director for Marketing and Communications at Lowell Observatory. And uh, you see behind me virtually uh, an image of the 126 year old Alvin Clark and Sons 24 inch refractor uh, that is uh, really a, a hallmark and, uh, and a national historic landmark here at the observatory. It's been lonely uh, for quite some time throughout this period of uh, dealing with uh, COVID-19 and we're anxious to get people back in, inside here. So uh, hopefully that won't be uh, too much longer. And uh, today though, I'm going to put on my cultural astronomy hat and we're going to talk about Sky, uh, stars in the Arabian skies. Now, cultural astronomy is the study of how societies relate to different celestial objects in the night sky. And this is a really neat field of astronomy because at the same latitude, we can look uh, here, for example, Flagstaff's latitude is 35.2 degrees north. And at the same latitude, the stars look the same. So the stars we see in the sky here in Flagstaff are the same, if you go across that red line, are the same as what you would see in Tangier in the north of Morocco or near Baghdad in Iraq. And so uh, when you look at the night sky from these same places, but still see different stories told about the dots in the night sky, um, you are seeing 100% culture. Uh, variations caused by culture. And so even the data is the same, the dots, uh, all of the stories are reflections of the different ways that those dots are interpreted by different cultures. So uh, here in the night sky, uh, we have a bunch of dots. And what happens with these dots is they all get names. Uh, we have a bunch of names here. Uh, many of them are Arabic in origin. Uh, some are Greek or Roman in origin. Uh, you may see some uh, familiar bright stars here like Vega, Arcturus, Regulus, uh, Spica. So, you know, some of these, uh, Vega, for example, actually goes back to ancient Arabia, which we'll see tonight. Um, but we have all these star names and then what we do is we connect the dots. Um, many cultures do this. And so uh, our standard view of the night sky, if you will, is a very um, Greek focused view. So the constellations connecting the dots are Greek constellations by and large. Um, to this, then what we do in modern astronomy is we chop up all the blank spaces in the night sky so that every star 
is in one and only one constellation. Uh, anything that is discovered in the night sky um, can be fit into a constellation. And so in modern times, a constellation is really defined as an area of sky in which anything is part of the constellation. Um, this is not really how we saw uh, the night sky back in ancient times. Um, the dots uh, were parts of the constellations, not the blank sky. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to peel apart these layers and go back to ancient Arabia and get a sense for how the night sky looked back then. And so, as promised in the title of my talk, we're going to look at a giant Arabian lion, a pair of vultures, and a scorpion. Oh my. Now, the first thing uh, that we'll notice is that stars were used for celestial navigation. Uh, much as they have been used uh, for thousands of years uh, to help navigate oceans, uh, stars in Arabia were used to navigate the shifting sands of the Arabian deserts. And so uh, we'll look first at uh, a very familiar object here. Uh, this is uh, the Big Dipper. And if you connect the two stars in the bowl of the dipper and follow the line, you will get to the North Star. Uh, we know this is Polaris because it is currently within about a degree of the North Celestial Pole. And that is the axis of the Earth projected out into space. And it is around this axis, this point in space, that all of the stars appear to rotate. Now, in Arabia, the pole was called al Qutb, but it wasn't located in the same place, at least not before the introduction of Greek astronomy. This large circle traces out uh, the path of the North Celestial Pole over the period of about 26,000 years. This is called precession of the equinoxes, and it means that uh, our North Star hasn't always been the North Star. If you go back about 1500 years to ancient Arabia, you'll see that the North Celestial Pole was in a black void of space, and instead there was a pair of stars that orbited around this point in space that together marked the position of North. So here we have the North Celestial Pole marked in blue, and we're gonna go back, every tick here is a century, and you'll see how the position of the pole has moved. Now these two red stars together marked uh, the direction of north. It wasn't just one single star. So this one that we currently know as the North Star was for the Arabs, the goat kid, El Jedi. And the other star nearby it was one of a pair of stars that together were called the two wild cow calves, al Farqadan. And today, one of these stars is still called Farqad or Farqad. The other one is called Kokub, which in Arabic just means star. And so it was these stars that together danced around the North Celestial Pole, marking the direction of north. And here we'll get a little video that shows that motion in the night sky. And so you can see the stars moving together. And yes, the North Celestial Pole is moving. Now, the arc of stars highlighted by this red circle uh, is part of another asterism that borrows the stars from what we know of as the Little Dipper. And this was called the protuberance, al -fats. And the protuberance was the mound in the bottom stone of a millstone uh, through which the axis went. And so this was imagined to be that mound in the sky. And of course, the pole, the axis, was going through the middle of that mound, not through what we know of today as the North Star. So we've got the protuberance, we've got the goat kid, the two wild cow calves, all together indicating the direction um, 
of North. Now, if we go back to our Big Dipper, let's look at the stars in the bowl of the Dipper. Together, this uh, group of four stars were called the Beer, a Nash. And this is a bed that would be used to transport the body of someone who had died. And following the bed or the beer are three stars that were called the children, the uh, the children of the beer. Uh, you'll see this sometimes as the daughters of the beer, um, but in the Arabic, uh, it doesn't have to be um, female children, it's just children. And so these stars, the children of the beer, they're following in this funeral procession. And as the Big Dipper moves um, around the North Celestial Pole, it will go down and over to the right from our perspective here. And so they're following the funeral beer in this procession. And so altogether, the grouping was called the children of the larger beer. And as we do today in recognizing the Little Dipper um, as something similar to the Big Dipper, um, back then, uh, the group of stars that we know as the Little Dipper was also called the children of the smaller beer. So what we're starting to see here is layering of multiple names for the same stars. Uh, and we're gonna see that more as we go on. So back in Arabia during this time, again, we're looking um, 500, 600 CE, and then beyond uh, after the development of Islam, and then the later adoption of Greek astronomy into Arabia. What we're seeing during this time is that uh, there were many different traditions. Um, it could be that some of these came from different tribes, and were kind of combined over time. Uh, in other cases, uh, some one person from the same tribe might use different words to describe the same star depending on the context. So if we look at the three stars in the handle of the Big Dipper, we'll see that in addition to being the children, of the beer, uh, they each had their own animal related names. So uh, the first one was called the black horse or black camel, Al Jaun. The next one was the she kid, Al Anak. And the next one was called the leader, Al Qaid. And this name survives today as Al Qaid uh, at the end of the handle of the Big Dipper. Now, if we look at the she kid, uh, that middle star there, there's a small one next to it uh, that was called the overlooked one. Um, small meaning it was fainter and still is. In fact, this pair of stars has been used across many different cultures as a test of eyesight. Uh, in Arabia, there was a phrase that arose around the overlooked one, which is a suha in Arabic. And the phrase said, I show her the overlooked one, and she shows me the moon. Uh, presumably, it was mentioned between lovers, uh, but we don't really know much more about the origins of that phrase. Now, if we look to uh, the horizon towards the north, there's a fantastic camel in the night sky. Uh, you may recognize some of these stars as the constellation Cassiopeia. Uh, these represent uh, a large portion of the hump of the camel. Uh, but under dark conditions, you can trace these, this curved neck of faint stars going from uh, modern day Cassiopeia down and up to the right, up to a few stars that represent the head of the camel. And so this is a great uh, constellation in the night sky because it really looks like a camel. Again, uh, you need dark skies to see this one. And then, of course, the camel is currently in the process of rising. Uh, we have the sky as we're looking at it about 9.30 uh, around this time, plus or minus half an hour, depending on your latitude. So uh, you may need a little bit more time to see the camel rise. And once you see it, it's one of those things that's difficult to unsee. 
Now, moving over to the Western sky, again, we have uh, the Big Dipper or the children of the larger beer uh, for reference in the north. And if you extend that handle and arc to Arcturus, uh, you will find Arcturus as a uh, orange red star that's rather bright. Now in Arabia, this was called Harris Asamat, the watchman of the sky, or sometimes the watchman of the north, Harris Ashamal. And it's because Arcturus has a really unique property that results from the geometries of the stars we see in the night sky. So on a certain day, uh, it changes based on your latitude, but generally mid-October, uh, you can see Arcturus rise just before the sun rises and then set after the sun is set. Uh, so this video will show you what that looks like. So here we're facing east just ahead of sunrise and then it fades away and then right after sunset we see Arcturus setting. And so it was perceived that Arcturus was always in the sky. And so it was called the watchman in the sky. <clears throat> now, if we move down from Arcturus, we'll look at a constellation that you may be familiar with. This is Leo, the Greek lion. And this bright star is Regulus. Uh, Regulus is a Latin name indicating uh, kingship. Now we have two other stars uh, that continue to this day to carry Arabic names, uh, Denebola and Ras al-Assad. But these names are actually pointing to Arabic descriptions of Greek astronomy. So Deneb or Denebola um, is coming from the Arabic Dhan uh, al-Assad, which means the tail of the lion, and Ras al-Assad, uh, means the head of the lion. So these are Arabic names describing Greek astronomy. But there was, in fact, an Arabian lion as well. And it was absolutely enormous. The lion, al-Assad, in Arabia, took up three quarters of the night sky when it was up. And to see this with your own eyes, it's just spectacular. So uh, for us right now in June, the lion is uh, partially setting. We can't see all of it. So we're gonna rewind the clock and go back to March temporarily. And now we can see the lion in all of its glory. Uh, again, this takes up three quarters of the night sky, about 135 angular degrees from the tip of its claws to the tip of its uh, feet. So let's take a look at all these parts of the lion that we see. Uh, out front, we have the extended forearm. Um, it's extended because this hand is outstretched and we can see the claws coming down from the two bright stars. The other arm is called the clenched forearm because it was um, seen to be grasping something. Next, moving on to uh, the circle uh, we have, this is highlighting a star cluster that is known as the Beehive Cluster, uh, Messier 44. And the two stars next to it were called the two nostrils. And so the star cluster was the sneeze. Uh, it was personified in this lion as literally the particles that were sneezed out by the two nostril stars next to it. Um, I love that part of the lion. Moving forward uh, down the length of the lion, we have the forehead, uh, the four stars uh, that you may know of as the sickle uh, from the Greek lion, Leo. In Arabic, the forehead is al -Jabha, and this translates to al uh, one of the star names that survives today. Going down further, uh, we have two stars that mark the mane uh, of the lion. And then we have uh, an L-shaped asterism, the two haunches of the lion. 
Below this, uh, this group of four stars uh, that you probably know as the constellation Corvus, uh, the crow, in Greek astronomy, uh, this was the rump of the lion. Um, I don't know why this rump was so far away from the lion. Uh, obviously, it must be a later addition to the growing constellation of the lion, um, but that's what we have, the rump of the lion. And then the two bright stars at the end are the two shanks of the lion, or the two legs. Uh, this star at the top of our screen here was the liver of the lion, Kebed al-Asad. Again, I don't know why it's not inside the lion's body, but uh, that's what came to us over time. And this cluster of bright stars was called the tail hair, or Hulbat al-Asad. And you may recognize this as modern-day Coma Berenices. Um, there's a fun story about the tail hair of the lion. So we'll go back to our view tonight to explore this story. And uh, the story says that uh, the lion was roaming around and he got angry and he thumped his tail on the ground. And when he thumped his tail on the ground, it scared the gazelles and they leapt away. Well, in the night sky, you can see three sets of two stars. And these are the three hoof prints left by the gazelles, or the three pairs of hoof prints, as they leapt away. So they were called the leaps of the gazelles, Khafazat Azibat. Now today, their star names survive as the first leap, the second leap, and the third leap. So the first is Alula, the second Tania from Athania in Arabic, and the third Talitha from Athalitha in Arabic. So we have the three leaps of the gazelles as they ran away from the lion. Now let's move on to um, another interesting topic, um, seasonal forecasting. So uh, there are many phrases when you look back in uh, the Arabic literature that describe the stars uh, either rising or setting uh, as indicators of seasons. Um, always the time frame was uh, the wee hours of the morning, uh, something that was called ghalas, when the light of dawn uh, mixes with the darkness and the redness in the horizon. So uh, at this time of ghalas, uh, you would see certain stars rise or set, uh, indicating seasonal change. Now this bright star uh, in the body of the uh, Arabian lion was on its own often called the weather change, a sarfa. And it was called this because uh, when the star set in the morning, just before sunrise, it indicated uh, the coming of spring. And when it rose in the morning, just before sunrise, it indicated the coming of uh, the cold weather as things were changing in the autumn. And so it was called the weather change. Now there's a fun phrase <clears throat> that arises from this. <clears throat> so it was also called the dog tooth of time, Nabadahar. And the phrase says, the weather change is the dog tooth of time, which it bears smiling broadly. And the origin of this is that when this star set uh, in the morning, just ahead of the sunrise, uh, indicated the change from cold to warmer weather. And uh, flowers started to bloom, uh, you could get outside longer, the days were longer, and um, that made people happy. And when you smile really big, you show your teeth, and not just your teeth, but your canines. And so the weather change is the dog tooth of time, which it bears smiling broadly. It's a really neat phrase and, um, and a very literal origin of it in the night sky. So let's continue to move across the sky. Uh, we're now looking southwest and we have the outline of the lion for reference. Again, there's Arcturus. 
And looking at multiple layers in the sky, Arcturus, uh, you will remember as one of uh, the two thighs or shanks of the lion, uh, Arcturus was also known as the spear-bearing sky razor. Well, that's quite an interesting name. Let's take a look at what's going on here. So, these stars uh, identified formed the spear. So this bright star had these two stars near it, a spear that it could throw. The other bright star in the leg of the lion was Spica, the unarmed sky razor. Uh, and so we have one with a spear that's armed and one that's unarmed. Now, why are they called sky razors? Well, in Arabic, this term is a simak, and it's something that raises up the canopy uh, in a tent. So it would often be referred to, um, or it would be used to reference uh, the tent pole in a tent. And so <clears throat> here in the night sky, these two bright stars, when they got to their highest points in their travels through the sky, almost due south, they marked together uh, this giant celestial tent pole that held up the canopy of the night sky. Again, quite um, figurative and poetic here. Now, uh, this group of four stars uh, at the bottom of the screen, in the context of the lion, it was the rump of the lion. Here in the context of the sky razors, it was the throne of the sky razor. So again, we see the same stars bearing a different name in a different context. And this is the, the layering of Arabian astronomy. So let's now move along to the scorpion. And the scorpion is mostly marked out by the stars you may know of as Scorpius, except that uh, the Arabian scorpion has claws extending forward. Uh, this goes back to Babylonian times, and maybe before that even, where the scorpion had claws, but during the, um, the time of uh, developing the zodiac, uh, this constellation took up too much space in the sky, essentially. And so the claws were converted into Libra as another zodiacal constellation. And so that is what was transferred to uh, Greek astronomy. And so the Greek Scorpius doesn't have claws, but the Arabian one certainly did. And uh, in Arabic, Scorpion is al Aqrab, And today that survives as one of the stars in the head of the Scorpion, Aqrab. Now, the two stars at the end were called Azubana, the pincher. And those stars survive in the most fun star names to say today in all of astronomy. Zubin al-Shamali and Zubin al Janubi. In Arabic, literally, this means the northern pincher and the southern pincher. Moving down, we have the crown uh, or the head of the scorpion, al Iqlil. And then the bright red star that we know today as Antares was called the heart of the scorpion. And the two stars on either side of it were together called the aorta of the scorpion. And so we've got some uh, specificity going on here, the heart surrounded by the aorta. Um, today, the stars of the aortas, aorta survive as a niyat, which comes from the Arabic. Moving on down, we have the segments of the scorpion, the raised tail, a shawla, which survives as shawla. And then we have the sting, el ibra. And the sting of the scorpion is what we would see today as M7. Uh, a star cluster in that location. Now, if we look at the scorpion and the lion, uh, these are two ferocious animals. And between them is a star grouping that's rather faint, so it was called the obscure, al-ghafr. 
But there was a fun phrase that was mentioned about this, and it was said that this uh, star grouping, al Ghafr, was the most favorable or the most blessed star grouping because it happened to be located at the non-dangerous end of the lion, away from its claws, and the non-dangerous end of the scorpion, away from its stinger. And so it was the luckiest star grouping in the night sky. Uh, and then below the scorpion, we have a bunch of stars that are rather bright and closely grouped together. These were called the stalks of dates. Now, if we move to the southeast, again, we have our scorpion for reference. And we're going to look at some ostriches. Now, we're in the modern-day constellation of Sagittarius, but in Arabia, this constellation marked a number of ostriches. So we have four ostriches that were the drinking ostriches because they're located in the Milky Way galaxy, um, as seen from our perspective on Earth. And then the other four stars were called the returning ostriches because they've already been to the Milky Way, the river, and are coming back. Now, where are they coming back to? They're coming back to the nest. And the stars of the nest are arranged in a semicircle because ostriches arrange their eggs widely spaced in a semicircle like this. And that helps minimize the, the risk to predators uh, grabbing them. And so that's why we have a, a semicircle for an ostrich nest. Uh, we've got another pair of stars here and a second pair of stars uh, that each pair was called the two male ostriches. Again, we have overlaying traditions here. And so that's a number of ostriches in the night sky. Now, we also have an interesting asterism here called the two rows. And once I show this to you, this is another star grouping that you just can't unsee once you find it in the night sky. So we have one going horizontally, as far as we would see tonight, and another vertically in the night sky. The two rows, um, they could be seen as two fence lines. And what's in the region defined by these fence lines is the meadow. And all of the stars in the meadow is the flock, the flock of sheep or goats, al Ghanam. Now there's two bright stars in this meadow. One of them, the brightest one, is called the herdsman, Ra'i. And the other one is his dog, which in Arabic is Kelp el Ra'i, and this survives as the modern star name Sebel Ra'i. Now we're gonna connect two very bright stars that are far away. Uh, one of these is that bright red star Antares in the constellation Scorpius, or the Arabic Al-Aqrab, the scorpion. And the other is one of two stars that we'll get to know as the two vultures. <clears throat> now, these two stars, as the two whimpering dogs, got their name because as they rose in the wee hours of the morning, this happened when the weather was getting really, really cold. Uh, and yes, even in Arabia, in the winter, uh, all of that um, heat goes away because there's no humidity and it gets quite cold at night. And so they were whimpering dogs because the dogs were so cold that they couldn't bark. They could only whimper to each other. So when those two, when those two stars rose, it marked the onset of very cold weather. Now we're shifting over, uh, looking due east. And again, we have the scorpion for reference. And, and now we'll look at the two vultures. So uh, again, the top one here is one of the two whimpering dogs. Um, but in the context of the vultures, it was 
what we came to know as Vega. Now, how did this happen? Well, there's a bright star with two stars near it uh, that form a V. And in Arabic, this was called a Nasser al waqia um, and in Arabic, this means that it's the vulture that is alighting. Its wings are bent because it's getting ready to land. The other vulture was a Nasser al-Ta'ir because um, it is the vulture with its wings spread out as it's flying or soaring through the sky. And so it also has two stars next to it, but they're all together in a line, like a, a bird with its wings outspread. And so Anasr Atair came to us as Altair uh, for the modern star name, and Anasr al Waqia got shortened as Vega from Waqia. Now, uh, Anasr al Waqia, Vega, uh, also takes part in an interesting story. So the story starts with four camel mothers, uh, and they are all grouped around a very faint star that was known as the young camel. And they're protecting the young camel because there are two wolves nearby. And so the alighting vulture, Anasr al waqia comes in to also help protect the young camel from the two wolves. Now, moving on, uh, we have Vega and Altair. These are two stars of uh, what we would call the Summer Triangle. And the third star that we'll see here is Deneb. Now, in Greek astronomy, this marks the tail of Cygnus the Swan. But in Arabia, it was a different picture. So we have uh, four bright stars in a row that were, na that were named Alphawadis, the Horseman. And the bright star that we know today as Deneb was called the rear rider, a riff. So it's the horseman that rides behind the line of horsemen out front. So right there you can see in the night sky uh, Arabic descriptions of Arabian astronomy versus Arabic descriptions of Greek astronomy. So this has been a tour. Uh, through summer skies, highlighting the brighter things you can see in the night sky. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Adams. That was uh, incredible as always. I'm always picking up new information whenever I see this, this program, uh, variations of this program. So it was just a delight to have you. Um, I do have a couple questions just for um, my own indulgence here. Uh, one is, I, I, could you paint a picture of kind of what the um, ancient Arabic world would have been like? Was this a, a, a fractured set of societies, a nomadic set of societies, or was it more of a, uh, a one, one unified society? And, and given, given that, do we find um, a diversity in star lore amongst that ancient uh, Arabian culture, or was there more of a, a unity? What did you find in your studies? Sure. Uh, so a lot of this is uh, something that developed organically over long periods of time. Um, you can Im imagine some of these stories getting started with, you know, some, uh, you know, caravan drivers around a campfire, perhaps, uh, talking about the night sky and talking about the different stars they used to navigate by. And, um, you know, you would imagine that the brightest stars uh, were probably named first and that uh, stories grew and developed around them. For example, you know, in what we just saw at the end there, the, the two vultures, great, those are two bright stars. Um, and then we have the story of the camel mothers. Well, maybe that developed later on as, you know, the story of the vultures got embellished. Um, you know, unfortunately, what we have that survives to this day is um, Arabic literature in, in several forms, uh, none of which is complete. So we have um, a body of, of literature uh, that's a bit historical in nature. Um, this is uh, written, you know, couple hundred years um, after the development um, 
of Arabic poetry. And so, you know, this newer literature uh, is very descriptive, but oftentimes the authors just say the Arabs. So we can't really parse out which Arabian tribe thought, um, you know, stars were named one way versus another way. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few isolated examples of this, but not much to really build a good picture. Um, before Islam, uh, there's a lot of pre-Islamic poetry that references stars in the night sky. And so, you know, based on the poet's tribal affiliation, you can extrapolate that probably that tribe knew of that star because otherwise they couldn't understand the poem that was being recited. So, you know, we have bits and pieces, but we know that um, some of these develops over time. Um, you know, a good example of this is uh, in the winter skies, uh, what we know of as the constellation Orion um, has this beautiful belt of three stars that are all together in a row. Um, these stars were very likely the first, uh, uh, first example of the constellation El Jauzat, uh, whose name has something to do with being in the middle of other things. Mm. And then over time, El Jauzat got arms and hands and a bow and other elements. Uh, and our modern star name, uh, Betelgeuse, comes from uh, Yed El Jauzat the hand of El Jozat. So, you know, we do know that, you know, once uh, formed, uh, some of these develop over time. Um, the lion is enormous in the sky, uh, and it may have started as bits and pieces that, you know, added on over time. Oh, great. Well, you did a great job piecing that all together for us. And um, my last question is, you know, do, is there any clear ties from perhaps Babylonian culture into this world that suggest a transfer of knowledge there or were those mostly um, divergent? Yeah, uh, there are some examples of that. Uh, I mentioned uh, the scorpion uh, was uh, most likely transferred from Babylonian astronomy. Um, you know, one of the, the difficulties is that, <clears throat> uh, you know, in Arabic, the written record only lasts so long. And then we get into oral folklore, which, you know, some of that was uh, likely preserved in the poetry, uh, but we don't know what transformations it may have taken before that point. Um, so, you know, similarities, we can say, yeah, probably there was a borrowing. Um, there's much more uh, robust evidence for borrowing um, and transfer of sky knowledge from, uh, say, Babylonia to Greece, Mm -hmm. um, and then later on, after the development of Islam uh, around you know, 622 CE, we do see uh, the development of Greek astronomy um, in Arabia. So uh, as there was a, a great translation movement that occurred, and as Greek works of astronomy, uh, including Ptolemy's Almagest, were translated, then, you know, these uh, Greek sky pictures made their way into Arabian astronomy. And so, um, you know, that's why I love this field. Uh, you know, when you dig deep, you get into all of these uh, cultural uh, interactions and, um, you know, and presumably it was bi-directional. You know, we don't know, uh, again, due to lack of record, you know, how, you know, Arab astronomy uh, back at that point may have impacted uh, Greek astronomy in some way, or uh, Mesopotamian astronomy. So um, yeah. it's a really neat field to be in, and, and there's <laughs> lots of things that we don't know and, and can't really know at this point. And still a lot, I think, to be done, right? I mean, I'm still awaiting for a good translation of, uh, English translation of the Book of Fixed Stars by Al-Sufi. I don't think, um, to my knowledge, that's been translated from Arabic um, to to. English in any published book so far. Is that true? Um, right. To my knowledge, that's that's still true. And um, uh, that's on my wish list uh, if I have <laughs> time uh, to uh, translate uh, that among some other works. Uh, that'll really open up um, our access to that kind of information. 
Well, and that's finally what I wanted to ask you is, when are we going to get a book from you on this subject? Because this is just such amazing, interesting stuff, and you're, you're such a, a, a fountain of knowledge on this. Um, are, are you doing something? Do you have anything in the works? or? Um, I am working in that direction. Uh, <clears throat> I've been here at Lowell uh, just over you know a year and five months. So, uh, you know, and of course, uh, there's been a lot going on, uh, not just in very recent months with uh, the whole COVID-19 uh, situation, uh, but last year was quite uh, a full year for us with our anniversary and mm -hmm. um, the moon landing, all that. So, um, yeah, that I hope is coming. Um, I'm getting uh, small articles out here and there. And... Uh, you know, long-term, absolutely. I want to be uh, getting out some books. Well, thank you so much. Uh, th this was a, a great uh, presentation, uh, always fascinating. Hopefully everybody uh, watching will be able to um, come and, and speak with you directly at, at next year's Star Party, which is June 5th through the 12th, 2021. Um, we're, we're crossing our fingers. We'll be able to celebrate that on site here at Grand Canyon next year. And Dr. Daniel Adams uh, frequents the Star Party, uh, and so we, we we hope we can connect everybody together next year. Um, do everybody please stay tuned uh, right after this program ends for the virtual telescope viewing Star Party uh, that we will begin uh, very shortly. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, thank you so much again, Dr. Adams, and uh, we hope to see you on site next year at the 2021 Grand Canyon Star Party. Thank you, Raider. Always a pleasure to be here.